Welcome to the podcast of data and analytics in business. We will learn from the leading industry experts using data and analytics to solve the problems and create values in practice. We will also learn where the industry is heading to and how data and analytics will shape the industry in the future. Most importantly, how they are preparing their business for digital transformation and disruption in the future. I am your host, Jason Tan, and thank you for listening. In this episode, we have got Tim Spicer. Tim is the head of automotive business at Asset Insure. At Asset Insure, Tim and his team deliver innovative specialist insurance solution and niche insurance product to the business community. Tim is also a qualified actuary who has 25 years of experience in the actual science working primarily in the GI and workers' comp sector. The focus of this episode is primarily on the add-on insurance. Now, while add-on insurance is probably not getting much of the attention or headline on the newspaper, like the general insurance or the life insurance, but add-on insurance is certainly in many parts of our life. Add-on insurance, you can see it really anywhere, such as the insurance for your credit card or the insurance when you are buying a vehicle and as you are financing it, the insurance that you're paying for that finance is also one type of the insurance. Other add-on insurance would be such as the tire and wheels for your automotive vehicle, as well as the insurance that covering the logistic when you are buying things online and having the thing shift to directly to your home. So those are the really the add-on insurance that are in many, many parts of our life. In the first part of the discussion, Tim shared with me exactly what is add-on insurance, how the market is running, such as the parties being involved that includes the dealer, the insurer, the distribution channel, as well as some of the business practice and process in this particular sector. We then spend a great deal of time in understanding some of the challenges, the structure of the market, the composition of the market, and often how the insurance are packaged and then subsequently sold to the consumer via the dealership. And part of that includes about how the add-on insurance are being priced. We then went on to discuss about the community-rated pricing that is currently existing in most of the add-on insurance, and then talk about the changes that Tim and his company are looking to introduce to move from community-rated pricing into risk-rated pricing. This part of the discussion then include the topics such as the technology, the use of the API, as well as the purchase of the data from the external company, such as Blue Book or Red Book, that allow them to enrich the data and subsequently enable the risk-rated pricing. With the introduction of the risk-rated pricing into the add-on insurance, I think Asset Insure and team are really going to make some revolution and changes in this in this sector. So I'm super excited and looking forward to see some of the changes that they are introducing in this space. Apart from the highlight of the use of the data and analytics to introduce risk-rated pricing, there are various highlights in this episode. If you are a senior manager, who comes more from the technical background or the IT background, I think you would really enjoy the focus and the understanding that team has got in terms of the product itself, the challenges that people are facing at various stages of that sales cycle of the adult insurance. Equally, this includes the purchase and buying behavior of the consumer are super duper important to understand how to sell a product in a market. The ability to look at the bigger picture, the economics of different stakeholders are extremely important to understand your chances of winning when introducing a new product into the market. 
or at least introducing the same product with different feature into the market. Kim really reminded me in the world of the business, data and analytics is only a part of the vehicle. It is really important to understand how to put together all of these various components together while understanding how to navigate the road ahead because of the surrounding environment. Whether you are someone who works in the insurance industry or maybe outside of the insurance industry, I would highly recommend to tune in for this episode and pick up a number of things that Kim is sharing with us. If you like more of this episode of how we understand data science are enabling the high performance organization like Asset Insure and many other companies that I have interviewed, make sure you click the subscribe button on your mobile phone. As always, if you have any question for me or team, make sure you reach out to connect us on LinkedIn or send us an email. And your little action of clicking the subscription, it would mean a lot for me to continue to bring more interview and discussion from the business leader around the world to share their experience with you. I am your host, Jason Ten, and thank you for listening. Good morning, team. Welcome to the Analytics Show podcast. Super excited to have you here. Another qualified actuaries to, to come on to the show. How are you today? Good, Jason. It's a sunny day here in Melbourne, as usual. <laughs> so, um, yeah, got back from Sydney last week, so I'm in isolation. So probably a perfect time to have a have a chat about what I've been up to lately because I'm I'm stuck at home for the time being for another week. So yeah. <laughs> perfect <laughs> time to it. escape from Sydney as they are having a lockdown. So uh, here we it's go. Right. <laughs> now let me get started. I want to start a little bit light in terms of uh, my research showing me that you're making a career move into the product and services for the automotive sector. So my question for you and for the listener who are actuaries or who are starting to become an actuary, what led you to move from a standard actuarial activities into product and service development? Yeah, good question. It's as simple as, you know, as they often say, variety is the spice of life. I've been in traditional actuarial roles for 25 years. I still have 10 or 15 years of working left and I just wanted a bit of a refresh to beef up my enthusiasm to continue working. And look, so, so far, so good. I guess the reason why I've gotten into developing products and services and, and, and doing the pricing as an actuary can and also the prospecting side of the business. So I need to find business, develop products for those businesses and price them and help them get them sold through those markets. So, look, I guess the reason why I was attracted to that specifically, and there's quite a few reasons. Look, over my working life, I've, I've witnessed many salespeople selling and promoting products that they just don't understand, right? So mostly the, the focus on the approach to selling is just pressurizing and hounding distributors or customers. And I think also a big shortfall with some salespeople too is that lack of understanding of the products means they're not really in a position to sort of have any live dialogue with the people who are working in a market can recognise that their consumers are demanding something and they, but they haven't quite got the ideas formed in their mind and they need to have kind of like a discussion with the salespeople to think what can we do to get something that works for customers, works for, the, say, the insurance company and is fair and reasonable in all respects. So customers get a good product at a reasonable price and, and insurers get to make a, a reasonable profit. And so if you don't have that understanding of the products, I don't see how you can really have a good conversation with your market around what they need and how you could adapt or evolve existing products to meet those needs or indeed develop new ones. So often a salesperson is purely focused on just getting the business of selling done. And as a result, you know, look, salespeople come under a lot of pressure and I've felt some of that pressure myself. And naturally, salespeople under that pressure to deliver sales, they, they tend to, they can in some cases get into a situation where they overpromise products can be, or maybe they overpromise what the price can be. That is, they say you can have it for $1,000 when the break-even cost is 1500 
And the problem with that is if they go out into the market and overpromise and they're locking themselves into under delivering, then typically when those salespeople get back to the office, they're blasting the people and risking compliance or indeed the actuary, um, because the things that they've said the market can have, they actually can't have because they're either illegal or unprofitable. And a lot of this stuff is it's largely avoidable if the salespeople will just have a better a better sort of understanding of these matters. And look, I'll make no bones about it. Another reason why I'm getting into this is from a purely mercenary standpoint. Yeah, I'm thinking of my own finances. So as I said, I've I've worked with salespeople often over the years and, and you do tire of seeing salespeople who are not strong performers. They're getting paid handsome bonuses simply for being party to selling good products that are they've got very sharp prices. And especially if I'm the guy who's designed and priced those products and I look at my bonus and it's far smaller than theirs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the mercenary aspect of it. So look, there's no doubt about it. If you're building relationships with distributors, developing products, pricing them and getting them sold, well then the better bonuses are hopefully there for the taking and there's no no denying that that's a that's a part of things for me and look I'm, I'm enthusiastic and hopefully knowledgeable about the products i've designed and priced and i don't expect i'll be the best salesman out there but i definitely won't be the worst i certainly feel i'm, I'm in a position to have those conversations with market participants about the existing products they have what features they'd like to see built in what's possible what's not possible that's really why I'm there is to listen to people, you know, and, and hear what they've got to say. And this product that you are designing is something that I'm really looking forward to find out and discuss more about is coming into the market and what and how analytic is powering it behind this product. But before we get on to the product, share with, with our listener about the Accenture company that you work for and also your role as a head of automotive business at the Accenture? Well, actually, Asset Insurer and I go back a long way. So back in 2006 through to 2010, I was working for Ernst & Young in Sydney and Asset Insurer uh, were my client and I was the appointed actuary to Asset Insurer for five years. So I've known those guys a long time and I've just maintained contact with the CEO I mean, the CEO that I, I've known for all these years, he, he actually moved on at the end of last year, but he was responsible for bringing me into the business as an employee 10 years after I was like a consultant to them. So that's our history. And look, asset insurer is a sort of, it's not a prolific insurer. It's, it's what I would call a niche insurer. So they focus on trying to find markets that they can do well in. So they're not generally looking to do the mainstream stuff. I mean, they don't have the scale and the, in terms of staff and capital and all those sorts of things to, to be trying to take on the big boys when it comes to things like home and motor and all those sorts of things. So they try and do, they focus on classes of business that people may not even have heard of. Or if they do, play, you know, so for example, Asset Insure plays on the boundary between banking and insurance. So they do financial risk products and surety surety bonds so that's something they've been extremely successful at but like any business they've kind of got to a point now where they've i wouldn't say they've saturated those markets but they've probably grown to near as where as far as they can grow in those markets and there's possibly some constraint and continuing to grow there so they're obviously looking to move out and to do other things so they do play in the motor space they own a business called enthusiast motor they're up in queensland that's sort of a a business that's it is comprehensive motor insurance, but it's focused on more the the enthusiast, so the, the collectible type of car, rather than just mainstream stuff. As a business, they're owned by a South African parent called Lombard. They have a little bit of a coloured history with a New Zealand insurer called CBL, who actually went belly up in 2018. Um, but APRA, the regulator, moved pretty swiftly and ring-fenced all of Asset Insure's assets and saved them from, you know, any kind of fire sale. And that was where Lombard moved in and, and, and bought, bought the shares in Asset Insure. And so we carry on alive today. As far as my role as the head of automotive business, I'm focused on 
many things to do with automotive. So I'm just saying categorically, I'm not involved in the enthusiast business formally. So the comp motor stuff, I'm not in that. But I am focused on retail add-on insurance in the automotive space. So that's the stuff we all know about from the recent Payne Royal Commission. So that's things like extended warranty, gap, tire and wheel, CCI. So we are about to commence playing in that space. So this is kind of almost hot off the press, really. So we've signed an agreement with a Queensland-based company called Australian Warranty Network, AWN, down there in uh, Tanamera near Logan Home. They're a very well-established business in the Australian market. They've been up and running for almost 30 years now. They've got a very strong reputation. They're the, probably the most highly rated add-on insurer on productreview.com.au with about 4.6 stars. So they're, they're night and day the best partner we could possibly hope for. And look, all my interactions with the with the people there, the CEO and all his staff, you know, they're a great team. And I'm really excited about what we're going to do there. In that regard, one of the key areas we, we plan on developing into would be, as you will have heard, many over the last for three or four years, many automotive manufacturers have, have lengthened the period over which they'll do a manufacturer warranty. Toyota, for example, used to do a three-year, 60,000-kilometre manufacturer warranty. That'll be now five years, 100,000, or five years unlimited. Can't remember which, but there's certainly more around the five-year mark now. Yeah, and some of them probably even have like, what, eight or seven or ten years, something like that. Yeah, look, some vehicles and some manufacturers like Kia, they're solid on seven, and Mitsubishi have recently um, gone to 10. And I believe in the UK at the moment, Toyota look like they're going to go to 10 years. So there's probably a lot of conditions around that. It won't be quite a pure 10 year manufacturer warranty, but it cuts into the extended warranty market as an add on insurer. So, but the issue is, is that someone's got to run all that and cope with all that risk that they're taking on. So, at the end of the day, the view that I have is that. Automotive manufacturers, they're good at manufacturing cars and selling them to people, but having a, a very long manufacturer warranty, that's essentially an insurance operation. You need systems for that, IT systems. You need staff who can deal with claims because there's ever-increasing pressure from the ACCC, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, around making sure that just because you've got the warranty, you've got to actually deliver on it because if a manufacturer has got such an is so overwhelmed with repairs that people are going to have to wait four or five months to get their repair. Now, I'm not saying that's happening, but if that did happen, that's essentially, that won't be meeting minimum standards and, and expectations. So I think in, in the next few years, manufacturers themselves will come to the realisation that they probably can't cope with all this because, of course, in the first three to five years, life of a car, that's when it doesn't have any problems. It's when it gets a little bit older that suddenly many, many things start failing and some of them will be big. So it's it's going to cost a lot of money and it's going to consume a lot of time and resources just managing all the repair process and making sure that it gets done right. So as well as all the regulatory sort of changes that are inevitably will accompany that. So I think there's there's a lot there potentially. And look, we would certainly look to partner with AWN in order to deliver that. And I don't think we'll be the only ones who'll be thinking about that. But certainly we want to build a presence in the Australian market around managing warranty risk with AWN so that we're in a position to play in that space should it arise. The electric vehicle is, I feel like is finally really taking its momentum now. And it looks like the consumer and also the government and all the regulators around the world is really pushing hard for the EV market as well. As of what you would just say, like all of these manufacturer promising seven or 10 years warranty and nothing is gonna happen. It seems like that timing of the later part of the warranty where it comes to the effect, at the same time, with the transition to the EV manufacturing and the capacity, I can't help but think maybe the disaster is going to be hit them really badly where, where there are two, two massive waves are coming together. Yeah, definitely onto something there. I think at the moment, a lot of certainly extended warranty providers, they will provide a level of warranty on an electric vehicle, but probably the big daddy problem is the battery itself. 
and that'll probably be excluded because they literally do have a limited life, as I understand it. So you'll probably find that all the normal bits of a car, like the suspension and the steering and the brakes and all those sort of things, they'll continue to be covered. But you might find that at the end of the day, electric motors are extremely reliable right up to the point where they fail. <laughs> so it's like they go along like that and then poof, that's it. You know, it's not like a, a mechanical engine which slowly degrades, you know what I mean? So I think it'll simply be a case. And the reason the, the electric motor dies is because the battery is just not working anymore. And I, I just don't think the battery is going to be something that will be covered. So you'll probably find that the manufacturer warranty will have a natural limit some small number of years before the expected end of life of the battery you know because they won't want to be putting new batteries in there unless it's just one of those one-off things that you know maybe the battery was made at five to five on friday afternoon and it was faulty in some way you know now let's come back to the add-on insurance i have read your paper that is also published in the 2021 all actuaries virtual summit it really gave me a better understanding of add-on insurance that i didn't quite have prior to this. My question for you then is, or perhaps for the listener, is add-on insurance uniquely Australian or can we find this product in many other jurisdictions as well? Yeah, look, I suppose I'll start by just reminding your listeners what add-on insurance is. So yeah. basically the, the definition in the, the, of an add-on insurance product is it's an insurance that's sold it's sort of like ancillary to a made, not the main asset. So obviously if you're buying a car and someone says to you, would you like a warranty or a gap insurance for your, to cover you in the event of problems with your finance or all these sorts of things, that type of insurance is an add-on. Similarly, if you're buying a mobile phone and someone says, would you like mobile phone insurance with that, that would be add-on insurance. Even home insurance could be deemed add-on insurance because you've got the, your house, which is your main asset, and then there's the insurance for it. In terms of how it's regulated, I think certain types of add-on insurance will be not subject to all these new heavy regulations that are coming in from the 5th of October this year, simply because they've traditionally been providing good value to consumers. So things like home and contents and, and comprehensive motor, I don't think they're going to get captured by what we call this deferred sales model or DSM. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But certainly the automotive add-on insurance products that I'm trying to distrib- get distributed through AWN's network of dealers, they absolutely will be. And so there's a whole lot of work that has to be go on between now and October to sort of get that done. So as I say, the add-on insurance for me is extended warranty, tire and wheel, gap insurance, and consumer credit insurance. So Warranty, I think we sort of understand that. If your car breaks down, warranty insurance will cover the cost of repairs provided it's one of the covered components. So typically, extended warranty doesn't cover things that just that are serviceable items, so like brake pads or oil filters. They're not covered because they're part of normal maintenance. But if you have sudden unexpected failure of any component in the car, whether it be the electric window motor or the gearbox, the transmission, that's what's covered by extended warranty. Tire and wheel is a product that covers you for damage to your tyres and your wheels. It's, again, it's not from them wearing out. It's when they, there's unexpected failure. So punctures are covered. If you scratch your wheels on the gutter, we're not going to we're not going to repair them under a tire and wheel policy. So it's, it's for structural damage. So if you did drive into a gutter and that bent your alloy, absolutely, you'll get a replacement. But we're, we wouldn't do it if you just got a bit of gutter ash from driving carelessly. You know what I mean? So gap insurance, what that does... Is if you, I'll effectively right now try and I'll try and sort of sell you a gap insurance. So you go into a um, a dealership, and you've got a car already that you're driving, and it's worth. The dealer says to you, "I'll trade that vehicle in twelve thousand dollars." You think, "Happy days, that's all right. That seems like a fair price for me." But you go, "Hang on a second, I've got one problem. I still owe sixteen thousand dollars on the finance that I've got." Right, so you're actually upside down by four thousand dollars at that point. But the dealer says, "No worries, amigo, I can deal with that. You can put that four thousand dollar debt into your next finance agreement, and you can still buy this car from me here for thirty five thousand dollars. All you need to do is borrow thirty nine thousand dollars. Well, we'll trade your car. We'll clear your previous debt with your previous financier. 
and you can go forward with a nice new car and a $39,000 loan to boot. That's all well and good, but you imagine, say, 15, 16 months down the track, you think about your car, you've just paid $35,000 for it, but 15, 16 months down the track, what do you reckon it's worth? Half of that. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, say, let's be kind and say it's worth $20,000, right? Now, you know what interest's like on loans, right? You pay mostly interest at first, and you're not really doing much damage to the principal. So at that same time that your car's worth 20000 that $39,000 loan might have only come down to, say, let's just say 33000 something like that. It'll depend on what the term is and what your interest rate is and blah, blah, blah. But let's just say it's at 33, right? And now you're out one night, you're not paying attention, and you go off the road and you drive your car into a power pole and you completely trash it. Luckily, you're all right because you had an airbag, but you've written your car off. It's a total loss. So here's what's going to happen. Your comprehensive motor insurance is going to say, okay, it's a total loss. You know, we'll pay out the 20 grand. And then your financier is going to say, mate, you owe me 33 grand because we've no longer got security for our loan. And you're thinking, I only got 20,000 from the, uh, from the comp motor cover. So that $13,000 shortfall, you've got to find that somewhere. And that shortfall or that gap, that's what gap insurance covers. Right? And of course, when that happens, that just gets you out of the finance contract, but you might have had stuff in your car that got smashed up. You might have had golf clubs or some CDs or, you know, because of the another total loss event is it being stolen or filled with water in a flood or there's a number of different things or it could have been burned out in a fire. So there's other stuff that's going. So we have extra benefits that you can pile on on top, on top of that. And in addition, you've got to get another car, right, which means you're going to be paying stamp duty and CTP and all these sort of things. So we have these extra benefits which are there to cover that. So that's what a gap insurance does. And I guess CCI, there's a number of different variants of it, but yeah, that's essentially if you become unemployed involuntarily or you get disabled, that is you get sick or injured and you can't work or or that sort of thing, or you're off work for a time and can't make an income, CCI covers your your loan repayments while you're um, stood down by reason of unemployment or morbidity. That's what the products are. And look, they've always been a bit of a fries with that type of offering. Do you know what I mean? You know, when you go go for the hamburger, would you like fries with that? So you go to your car and they go, would you like some insurance with it? And then so, and I guess it's, to answer your other question, it's not uniquely Australian, absolutely not. So it exists by different names in many other jurisdictions, in, including the United States, the UK and New Zealand. And look, it's had all the same problems in those jurisdictions. It's often sold through dealerships. The commissions embedded in the premiums are very high. And there have been some poor sales outcomes, you know. So I, I guess the most well-known overseas debacle with add-on products is probably what they call, we call it CCI here, but in the UK it's called PPI, Personal Protection Insurance. So that's a similar type of product which is sold not only by banks but also by car yards and all this sort of thing. And, and PPI, you know, you Google PPI in the UK and there'll be a, a long pages and pages in your Google search of all the bad things that happen to people in the UK with PPI. So it's certainly the same basic products are available in many other jurisdictions and they've had many of the same problems. Right. That makes sense now. I think the that on insurance. Now, your paper also highlighted some challenges in the industry, apart from some of those that you mentioned, as well as this pricing methodology. Would you share with us more about it? Yeah, and I guess that sort of builds on what we were just discussing before. As I say in the paper, when bad things happen, if you're a half-decent detective, you'll always look for the motive. Why are they doing that? So why did dealers insist on products having really high levels of commission? Why did they railroad people into buying these things, you know, like telling people that if you don't buy a gap insurance, you can't have the finance or selling a CCI product to someone who is unemployed? and they would therefore never be able to claim. So there were all these bad things that happened, but you've got to ask the question why. And I guess the fundamental issue with the motor industry is dealers don't make much money selling cars. They just don't make it. They do not. But the manufacturers pile the pressure on to dealers to really move the cars on, right? And actually, this led to something that's not strictly related to add-on insurance, but you may have heard of this term, cyber cars. What it is, it's... There's an outfit called 
VFACs who monitor what are supposed to be new vehicle sales volumes. And the manufacturers look closely at the VFACs data to see how many vehicles of a particular brand and model are being sold in a country at any one time, and in particular in Australia. But the thing with VFACs is they weren't strictly speaking sales of the car. The VFACs would have noted the day the vehicle was first registered in Australia. So typically you would expect that when the vehicle gets registered, it's because the car yard has sold it. And so it's gone from being a brand new car, it's sold and someone's driving off with it. But what was actually happening was a lot of the dealers for particular manufacturers, and Holden was certainly one of them, were struggling to get these vehicles sold. And so the manufacturer, and and in the case of Holden, General Motors out of the US were saying, hey, guys, where are our sales, you know? And so what the dealers were doing is they were registering these cars so that effectively they had this massive fleet of demonstrator vehicles. So on the VFAX data, it looked like they'd sold these cars, but actually they hadn't. They were just having, and they were having to store these cyber cars because they, they looked like a sale in the data, but they weren't really a, a sale, you know. So if you look back in the, the history of Australian new vehicle sales, there would have been a bulge about three or four years ago that probably is a little bit artificial in that those cars were just registered by the dealer and they just had a pile of demonstrators for a while. But look, so that's another story. But So there's no two ways that manufacturers put pressure on dealers to move these cars, which, as I said, they don't make much money out of. And, and in addition to that, the dealers also put pressure on dealers to sell those cars out of big fancy premises in very expensive locations. So, you know, there'll be a need to have big glass front windows with carpet and coffee machines and granite tiles on the floor and all these sorts of things. And it'll be in one of the most expensive parts of the city, you know, so that as everyone drives up these main arteries, they see these brands advertising themselves with their big glorious premises. And of course, these things cost a truckload of money. And they are also moving into the shopping center now. And I can imagine how much it will even cost in terms of the lease. And That's right. You know, and it, it's expensive to get these sales done. And uh, the deal is not really making any money out of selling the, the cars themselves. Then what they need to do is they need to make money out of selling the related products. And that's where the pressure came on for the finance and the insurance, or F&I as it was called. So before we leave that little theme of the manufacturers putting all this heat on the dealers to do that, you've got to remember also the manufacturers get their own heat. So often in a lot of countries around the world, there could be big government subsidies being sent into these manufacturers. And of course, the government wants basically wants to see that that's not just sunk money. So that they'll be under pressure from the government to keep that ongoing subsidy going. So they need to get those vehicles moved on and sold so that they can say to the government that's giving the subsidy, it's a worthwhile investment. And so it goes on. So you just sort of see that it's just piling on pressure down the chain. And obviously the consumer is benefiting in some ways. So you could probably say that the upshot of how things are at the moment is customers are probably getting getting the cars for too little money. They're not paying enough for the car. And that's forcing the dealers to try and, you know, bring a bit more money out of them on the finance and the insurance and all these other aftermarket products, you know. So some non-regulated products like you might have upholstery treatment and it might cost you $500 and all it is is someone in the uh, service department spraying a $5 can of Scotchgard on the leather upholstery. That, and I'm not joking. It could be it could be as extreme as that. Yeah, I was going to say, I think if we look at the uh, historical pricing data and when taking into the inflation into the consideration, technically the price of automobile vehicle actually is not rising at all. It's pretty much staying flat. That's right. And what you're getting is obviously improving vastly all the time. I mean, the reliability of the modern vehicle is astounding. I mean, the technology side of things aside, because Technology is probably where most of the faults in modern vehicles reside. So, And by that, I mean voice recognition software. So you can give instructions verbally to your sat-nav. That probably doesn't work particularly well in all cases. But just the basic mechanical stuff like the engine, the transmission, the drivetrain, and all these, the mechanical components of, say, 40, 50 years ago were constantly failing and led to the rise of the Japanese vehicle and the demise of the, the English and the, the other European vehicles. That sort of stuff now 
all cars are very, very reliable relative to the vehicles that were on the road 40 years ago. Yet, as you say, they're probably a much lesser proportion of someone's income today than they were back then. Now we're blowing all our money on houses, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are in Australia. <laughs> we have four or five cities in the top 10 best livable city in the world, so we got to pay for the price for that. <laughs> and that is true because it is good living in Australia. You can't deny it. That's the issue, right? The, the challenge of the industry is... The dealers don't make much money selling cars, so they were trying to make a truckload of money out of overcharging for the finance and insurance. So in my area, you know, 50 to 80% of the premium being paid as commission was not unheard of. And similarly, you would have had the same kind of things happening with the finance side of things. So the commissions for basically the dealers were incentivized to get somebody into a loan at an interest rate of 16% to such an extent that they would have made more in commission from one loan at 16 than they might have made from 10, 15 loans at a more modest interest rate, like 8%. So that's just how it was, you know. The other issue was obviously the premiums were, and in many cases still are, largely community rated, i.e. a one price fits all, and we'll talk about that throughout today. Let's say the sales practices are unacceptable, yeah, yeah, dealers telling people, if you want finance for this vehicle, you must buy gap insurance. And that's absolutely not the case. And selling CCI to the unemployed or the other thing that happened with, war- you know, warranties, where warranty got tricky was it wasn't always clear where the Australian consumer law ended and the extended warranty could actually pick up. So there was never so much of an issue with warranty being a bad value product. It was just where that was necessary because it was it hasn't always been clear when your rights under Australian consumer law ran out. But I guess in the last 12 months, that's sort of become a little bit clearer. And we'll perhaps talk about that a little bit later. Indeed, I think the Royal Commission is reading that and I think you submitted the paper. So that looks like there will be some changes in that industry. Now, I am curious to know, apart from the commission that could take up 50 to 80%, of the premium people actually pay for the automotive and on insurance and a few other challenges that you were highlighting, what are other resistance or challenges or barrier to doing well in the automotive add on insurance? And you just mentioned about the community rate of pricing. You say that community rate of pricing is perhaps one of the factors that play into these challenges that everyone is facing them. It definitely is. I mean, look, like anything, the big problem to doing anything new is the will to change, you know? And it's as simple as if you wake up one morning, look at yourself in the mirror and think, crikey, I need to lose 20 kilos. Well, you know, you've got to eat a lot of lettuce and do a lot of running, don't you? And none of us are particularly enthusiastic about doing either of those things. So there's a lot of resistance to change. And look, certainly an insurer that lacks the analytical capabilities to analyse their data and form appropriate conclusions. They can't tell what's what the problems really are. They might put undue weight on some anecdotes but not others. So what you really do need is you need the analytical capability within the insurer to make sure that you can identify where the problems are and also how to, and to devise remedies. And I guess in answering this question, a lot of it is does come down to can you find out what's wrong and can you fix it? But then it comes down to it being hard to fix because you get resistance both internally within the insurer and externally at dealerships and elsewhere. So I think it's the barriers to doing well are you got to understand that for decades, dealers made a lot of money selling finance and insurance alongside the car. And there's no two ways they became addicted to getting that easy income stream, right? And I guess there are probably some dealers still out there who wish for the good old days, which are now most certainly over. And so there's a lot of dealer apathy out there about selling out on insurance. They think they they can't, it's not worth getting out of bed to try and sell an insurance product or a finance contract. They'd rather focus on other things. And look, that's another one of the issues is that there are still regulatory issues. And I think one of the biggest regulatory issues that I highlighted in the paper that I put out through the Institute of Actuaries a couple of months ago was that there are effectively two types of warranty insurance. So there's insurance warranty, which we'll be selling through AWN shortly. 
And that's obviously, that's regulated by ASIC, it's regulated by APRA. Consumers have a lot of protection when it comes to insurance warranty because as an insurer, we have to demonstrate our high level of capital. So there's a lot of very little solvency risk. So if that person needs to claim, they have a high level of confidence that we'll, we'll have the money there to pay that claim. If they get into trouble and we have a disagreement over whether they can claim or not, they've got internal dispute resolution, external dispute resolution through the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. There's a whole, if you like, industry dedicated to resolving disputes in a fair way. And you can read about that on, online all the time. And that's where the other type of product that you have out there, and I'll call them service contracts. So these service contracts are not regulated products. So they're not insurance products. They're not sold by someone who's regulated by ASIC. So you don't need to have an Australian Financial Services Licence or AFSL. So these are products that are just put together by dealers on their own paper. So you're relying on the financial strength of the dealer to be around when you need to pay claims. If you run into trouble with the dealer and there's a disagreement around whether you can claim, there's possibly no industry consistent dispute resolution process that you can go through and you might end up in a scrap and end up at VCAT or you know the, the, the administrative tribunal in your state. Yeah, you're not going to get anywhere with that, you know what I mean? And so at the moment, the laws, they provide an exemption for dealers to sell these service contracts because it's deemed to be, they've got what's called the, I think it's called the incidental product exclusion under section 763E of the Corporations Act. So they're, they're not regulated by ASIC. So these products can exist. And these service contract products have commissions of 40 to 50% in, embedded in them typically. They all, a condition of the service contract is that you definitely get the servicing done at the dealership that sells you the service contract. Whereas when we sell you an insurance warranty, you're free to go and get this vehicle serviced wherever you like. So there's really no conditions on it. And that's the whole problem is that at the moment, service contracts are very attractive for a dealer because they can take 40 to 50% of the equivalent to premium, the service contract fee, as just commission for themselves. Whereas an insurance product, there's no way it's going to pay 40 to 50%. You'll be lucky if it gets north of 30 and most likely closer to 20 simply because you'll draw the ire of ASIC who will get upset if you're putting embedding excessive commissions into your premium rates. That's a big problem. That's a huge barrier. It's not particularly analytical. Another big source of problems with add-on insurance, automotive add-on insurance, is just the fact that a lot of the products are community rated. So that means a very similar price regardless of your risk. So for example, you can imagine if you drive a small Japanese hatchback, it's two-wheel drive, you know these things are just ultra-reliable. They never break down. If you're paying a very similar premium for that as what you're paying on, say, six-cylinder diesel-powered Peugeot, a French vehicle, and you may may well be paying the same amount of money. I'm telling you, that Peugeot, it's going to be in the garage a lot, and when it is, it's going to cost you a lot of money. Whereas the, the little Japanese car... It's just super reliable, you know. People probably don't even realise just how unbelievably good at manufacturing the Japanese are. They are just, they're night and day ahead of everybody else in terms of that operational efficiency. So even the experts at Porsche regularly go to Japan for, for, for a, you know, a dose of learning on how to do things well. And Porsche is really the only manufacturer that can claim comparable reliability to the Japanese manufacturers and the Koreans for that matter. They're also, they've really come along a long way and evidence of that is the long warranties that they offer on their cars. Mm. Given that the extensive works and the involvement of the actuaries in the insurance company, I'm curious to know why some insurance market, for example, the automotive add-on, still have largely community-rated pricing and especially other insurance market have really moved on from the zone pricing into the risk-rated pricing? That's a good question. And I guess, you got, again, you look back to the history. If an insurance company wanted to sell add-on insurance products through a dealership, the dealer really had retained very strong control over access to the customer. So if you said, we want risk-rated products with low commissions to be sold through your dealership, 
the dealer would just turn around and say, well, that's all very well and good, ABC insurance, but I've got XYZ insurance over here who will quite happily sell me a community-rated product with 50% commission, so see you later. And that insurance company that tried to do the right thing just wouldn't even get to sell a policy because the dealer would have no interest in doing business with them. I mean, at the end of the day, risk rating is complicated, right? So a dealer has to understand a lot more. And this sort of comes down to the mentality of the salesperson on the floor in terms of keeping score for themselves. If they know that, say, a gap policy is $1,200, including stamps and GST, so let's say $1,000 excluding stamps and GST and commissions, 50%, they know that every time they sell a gap policy, they're going to get $500 in commission. So when they think of their day, I sold eight gap policies today, Eight times 500, that's four grand. And they liked being able to keep score of that. Whereas when the price moves around all over the place, they don't know what they're going to get in commission until they see the calculation come up on the quotation. Risk rating is something that they are familiar with because a lot of dealerships do sell comprehensive motor and comprehensive motor is highly risk rated. And so this is nothing more than just saying, well, we're going to bring you know, risk rated warranty and risk rated gap into this market as well as risk-rated comp motor. But that's fundamentally the problem is that the dealers don't want the issue of, they don't want the complexity, they don't want to have to sit there and explain to people why the premium is $500 for one person and $1,600 for somebody else because it depends on the risk associated with the car. It just makes life more complicated for them, so they've resisted it. That's why risk rating is, is not really there. There's just been no need. So a dealer didn't have to sign up for all that additional complexity to do it. And then you think about even now going forward, if you're a dealership, right, that sells a mixture of cars, so if I sell Toyotas and Volvos, then at the moment I might have a a quite similar price for those two vehicles if I'm talking about a warranty. But if I've got risk rating, it's going to go like that. So I'm going to probably have quite a hefty premium for the Volvo and I hate to pick on any particular brand, but let's just say a European vehicle versus, say, the Japanese vehicle, which are notoriously extremely reliable. And that's the problem is that you get this big differential in price. And then you get, and then the way the dealer will counter what they want to say. So you might have a situation where the community rated warranty premium is $2,000. But when you bring in risk rating, the warranty on the Japanese car drops to 1000 but the premium on the fear vehicle goes to 4000 And then what the dealer will say to you is, well, I don't want that premium of 1000 because if I take 20% commission, that's only 200 bucks. whereas before on, at 2000 I could have got $400. So I'm going to have to do twice as much work to restore my income back to where it was. So you'd sort of think, oh, well, they'd be happy with the $4,000 premium because you know they're going to get twice as much commission they go now four thousand is too expensive i'll never sell any so there's a lot of dealer resistance to to making that move and so effectively at the moment any person who buys a japanese car with a warranty is probably cross-subsidizing any person who buys the the warranty on the european vehicle but what's actually happening out there in the market is People buying Japanese vehicles are going, well, I'm buying this car because I know it's so reliable. There's no way I need to waste another $2,000 on a warranty. So I just won't buy it. So warranty sales have collapsed in the area of Japanese and Korean vehicles. They're actually maintaining a reasonable level on the European stuff. But of course, the price of warranties is having to go up because these are actually more risky and you've no longer got the Japanese and Korean vehicles there to subsidize them. Can't help but to think about the consumer purchasing behavior and also the psychology. Now, there is a study showing that when we as a consumer just make a big, massive purchase, in this instance, it is the automobile vehicle. So a European car, say, that would cost fifty or $60,000. So, and then, say, the Japanese car would cost the $30,000 mark. Regardless where is the case and whether we have the risk rated or the community rated pricing, as the dealer are presenting the add-on insurance, as the dealer are presenting the extra money for the mat and extra money about this and that, the idea of the secondary sales often are so successful is because 
as we were looking at the price presented to us to say that add on insurance, a couple of thousand dollars or whatever, the extra for a few more hundred dollars compared to the large purchase that we just made, the poll that we see, it often makes us like, oh, that is so incredible. I have just made the purchase of 50 or 60,000 or 30,000. And the likelihood and the probability of buying whatever is presented after closing the big seal is always learned. That being said, it may not be that matter, do you think so? Like in terms of whether it's a community pricing or risk-rated pricing because because of that consumer psychology uh, the behavior at that point of the time when they are making the purchase, that's number one. The number two equally is, the people who is buying the European car, they are not going to ask how much is the add-on insurance for the Japanese car. Oh, no, that is expensive, so I, I think it should lower down. And equally, the people who are buying the Japanese car is not going to ask how much is the add-on insurance for the European car. So they would never really try to understand the pricing for the other class of the car anyway. So if we were to take that all of those things into the factor, does this still make a difference? Well, I suppose that's a fair question. And I guess it depends what you have to spend, right? So, yeah, if you're talking about buying a new car, because if we're talking about add-on insurance, we're not really talking, and warranties, we're not actually talking about new cars. We'd be typically talking about a car that's already four or five years old at least and, and possibly up to 15 years of age. So in this market, you're... You're talking about a car that, yeah, look, there's undoubtedly there are second-hand vehicles worth 30000 but the rump of the market is in that sort of fifteen dollars to $30,000 range, right, if it's a Japanese vehicle. And so a $2,000 warranty on a $20,000 car, that's like paying GST all over again. You know, so it's 10% of the, of the price. So you've got to ask, is it worth it? And I think that's what I said before. I think the market kind of tells you because the market for extended warranty has, has shrunk away. Firstly, understand that 55% of all vehicles on Australian roads are Japanese, and another 15, one five, are Korean. So Japanese and Korean vehicles combined, that's 70% of the vehicles on the road. And by and large, warranties on Japanese and Korean vehicles, extended warranties on used Japanese and Korean vehicles, are just not getting sold at the moment. I don't know why, but you would think it's got something to do with price. Because if you're if you have to stump up with an extra two thousand bucks, which is quite a lot of money, people generally would try and chip, you know, would try and bargain a, a sale price of twenty two thousand down to two thousand. They don't want to go and just going to happily give up another two thousand for nothing, are they? They have to be convinced it's worth it. And I think people recognise the high level of reliability on those five, 10-year-old Japanese and Korean vehicles, and they think, well, I don't really need to spend 2000 bucks on this. I've owned these things before. There's no way I've spent two grand on repairs on this thing. I might have only spent 500 bucks, And that's the issue, right, is that if the price is 2000 because you're getting all the people who own Japanese and Korean vehicles to subsidise the people who need to really be charged 4000 for the European vehicle, they're just thinking, I don't want to know. But I think if you've got a price, say, that's under $1,000 for a warranty for 24 months, you know, people might go, you know what, that's actually starting to make sense. Again, just speculating, but certainly there's an indisputable fact. Extended warranty sales on Japanese and Korean vehicles are at an all-time low, whereas the bulk of the sales now are really coming on European vehicles. And so the, ins- the add-on insurers are actually starting to get a little bit burnt because they haven't quite responded to the increase in premium rates that they need to put through to, to pay for the European vehicles. So they're in that anti-selection spiral now where they think the price needs to be there, but then the claims go to there, so they put their prices up, but they're sort of chasing premium increases are, are, for, are lagging behind the, the rise in claim costs as more and more Japanese and Korean vehicles just exit the market. So look, I think that the warranty premium is quite significant and it needs to be value for money. I agree. Now, for the benefit of the listener who are not necessarily familiar in terms of the actuary works or the risk-rated pricing versus the community-rated pricing, would you share with us what is the difference between the community-rated pricing versus the risk-rated pricing and what are the benefits for each of them? Oh, sure. 
community rated pricing just means a very flat pricing structure. So regardless of how risky the vehicle is, for whatever risk it is, so you can have an extremely unreliable vehicle and a very reliable vehicle getting charged the same premium or a very similar premium. So that's community rating. Whereas if this vehicle over here costs breaks down five times as often as this one here, then you'd expect the premium for this one to be five times as much. That's risk rating. And you can have things, you can have partial risk rating, which maybe it puts a little bit of a loading on on the risk for these more unreliable cars and so forth. And look, there is some of that out there as well. Like I've seen pricing regimes where they go, all these makes here will give them the standard price, but if it's a performance car with turbocharging, we'll add 100 bucks. And so that's sort of partial risk rating, but it might may well be that the turbocharging takes the performance of the vehicle up such a notch and that usually turbocharged vehicles are they're more expensive in many other ways you know they need better brakes they need better suspension of course all these things cost money the vehicles tend to be driven harder so they break down more often so it won't be just a hundred bucks more to run those turbocharged vehicles it might need to be three times the price and so if it doesn't fully reflect the risk then it's only a very slight tilt in the right direction but doesn't go far enough so that's essentially what it is and if you think about comprehensive motor right now we all know if we go out there and try and get a quote if you're if you're a 22 year old male driving a high performance car you're going to get a very high premium with a big excess that's if you can get any insurance at all right that's going to cost you whereas if you're my age driving a low powered you know one of these horrible little 1.3 liter cars with a tiny little sewing machine engine in it and you just drive along very slowly and safely there's no premium to be paid at all. It's just a very small premium. So if we were all charged the same thing, I'd get very upset because I'm effectively paying premium to help some hoodlum in a uh, big, powerful car. He's only been driving for two two years. Um, that's, that I'm paying for them rather than me who's never going to have an accident. You know? So that's pretty much the difference between it is. And as I say, the what are the pros and cons of community rating? Well, the pros of community rating are that it's simple. And look, sometimes community rating in some settings can have some sort of justification, particularly if, say, the people who get the benefit of the cross subsidisation are, say, in the lower socioeconomic bracket. So that could be good. So a classic example of that is health insurance or any of these sort of things where even though there are probably people living in poor living conditions in the so-called bad areas of town, they probably have a lot more medical problems than someone living in the great areas of a town with a big income, right? But we don't charge people more for that, for their health insurance. And in fact, they get charged the same because there's no rating even on age. And also the, the person who lives in the well-to-do areas with a big income is going to pay a truckload more tax as well. So, so there can sometimes be a justification for community rating if that's what the, the community wants. But I think in the add-on sector, there's probably no such justification because it should really be wealthy people buying European cars and less wealthy people buying the Japanese cars. So why would people with less money buying Japanese cars want to subsidise rich people to buy Mercedes-Benz? You know, it doesn't make sense, you know. So that's pretty much it. And look, for an insurance company, it's not good to be community rated either because if you're an insurance company that has one price for everybody, you have to make sure that the mix of business that you write is staying in balance. And this is actually what's happening in warranty right now because historically with 70% of vehicles being Japanese or Korean in the mix of sales, there was a lot of premium coming in from the Japanese and Korean cars which could be moved across to help fund paying claims on European car. But as these vehicles have said, no thanks, it's no good for us, it's bad value, You've now got a situation where if the insurer goes out there with the same premium they always have, but now they've only got European vehicles, they haven't got enough money to cover things. So they put their rates up a bit, and then some of the better cars that are still in the mix move on, and the rate, and that goes up again. And so you always have the situation where the premium is chasing the claims, and all through this, the insurer is losing money. And, I mean, I suppose the classic example of that goes back to the 1970s when life insurers first started differentiating their prices depending on whether someone smoked cigarettes or not. So back in the day, you know, if you were of a particular age and sex, you got charged a certain amount of money. And then one insurer suddenly comes along and says, well, you know what, I'm going to have different prices for smokers and non-smokers. So, of course, they put their rates like that. 
And of course, all the non-smokers go with that insurance company, but the smokers don't go near it. They go to the one that's got the flat rate price. But of course, that life insurer that's still community rated and didn't take account of smokers versus non-smokers didn't respond and they got all, all smokers. And so it cost them money because they didn't get the cross-subsidy from the non-smokers. So these things are, you know, these concepts are 40, 50 years of old. You know, there's nothing new in them. So that, that's fundamentally it. I suppose I um, I don't see many advantages to um, community rating unless there's a definite sort of benefit for somebody who's in need of that cross-subsidy. That is a really good analogy that you just used. And perhaps that is what we need in the industry to have someone to lead the tide. On that note, do you have any plan to take the automotive add-on insurance industry towards the rated pricing? That's absolutely 100% my plan. <laughs> So, <laughs> so you are the insurer who will start introducing the the, yeah, the well, rate to the smoker and non-smoker. <laughs> that's right. Absolutely. We're going to charge different prices for smokers versus non-smokers. Well, we, we're actually not – we don't care whether you smoke or don't smoke in terms of the cars, but certainly we, with the um, business that we're going to try and do through AWN, Australian Warranty Network, we're certainly going to have lower prices for Japanese and Korean vehicles versus, say, US or European vehicles, all else equal. So if you've got two small petrol-powered cars, front-wheel drive, whatever, you can expect that the premium rate on the European vehicle is going to be three times the premium on the Japanese or Korean vehicle. Not two ways about it. And look, we get it. We probably won't sell any any warranties to against a European vehicle. But from my perspective, I think, well, 70% of the vehicles out there are Japanese or Korean, and we've got lower prices. So if the market was perfectly competitive, we should do well. However, this comes back back to what I said before, is that you can then strike the barrier of making sure that the dealer understands what's going to happen in this situation, because some dealers will say, well, I don't want to drop the premium from $2,000 down to $1,000 because I'm going to get half as much commission. But our our argument will be, well, your customer's going to get a better deal on our warranty. They're going to get exactly the same coverage for half the money or whatever it is. So it should be easier to sell them. So even though you get less money per sale, you should be able to improve your penetration. And they would get the volume as well. Absolutely. I mean, if you sell five times as many cars for half the money, you're still going to get two and a half times as much money as you would otherwise, right? And they're not going to spend their whole day trying to convince people to buy products they know they're never going to buy. You're much more likely to get a sale if the if the price is, as I said, I think that, that customers are not completely stupid in that if you're buying a car that you know is very reliable and they go, oh, I'll give you a 24-month warranty for $2,000, they might think, oh, well, anything, I'll be lucky to punch through $1,000 in repairs you know, over the next two years because these cars are so reliable. But if you say, well, I'll offer you a, I'll offer you a warranty for $900, and you think, ooh, that's a good deal, you know, because, yeah, something big could blow. And at $900, you might get you might get a bite. And, of course, you might get many, many bites. And so as long as you can get the penetration up, you could actually do better. So that's our sort of fundamental strategy, really, for that component of it. And look at the products that we're selling are all the top-level quality as well. So these are ex- what they call exclusion warranties. So they are an extension of the manufacturer's warranty. So the same level of coverage that you get there. We're not going to have all this fine print that provides lots and lots of excuses and reasons why we won't be paying your claim. We, if it's covered under the manufacturer's warranty, it'll be covered under our warranty. And if there's any dispute, you've got dispute resolution services. We're a signatory to the General Insurance Code of Practice. We've got to do the right thing by our, our customers, you know. So absolutely, that's where we're going with these products. So the context that you have given us earlier, talking about you know how these add-on insurance will take place, distribution, and clearly the dealer own the large chunk of the distribution channel, and they are pretty much the access point. And equally, we cannot quite expect that the salesperson at the dealership to be fully trained up or at least take the ownership of understanding the risk rated pricing, et cetera. As a result of that, the data collection in asking the right question, collecting the right data, et cetera, so that we can do well in terms of the risk rated pricing 
it seems like it's going to be a barrier. And that seems to me is a barrier of why it was a challenge in the past. Do you foresee this continue to be a challenge or what are the challenges that you think that we'll be facing in introducing the statistical analysis or the GLM that typically done to move this from community rated pricing into risk-based pricing? You know, in all honesty, the challenges that we face in bringing in risk-rated pricing are generally not from lack of data. So there is a big reason for that. And fundamentally, it's the existence of organisations like Red Book and Glasses and Blue Book and Datium Insights and all these automotive analytics firms. So Cox Automotive is another one. I hate to leave any out or put excessive emphasis on one versus the other. But these companies, what they do is they have all the specifications of every vehicle down to extremely granular detail. So we're at the stage now where you can set up a API, an automated programming interface between yourself and one of these organisations, possibly with MotorWeb involved or whatever, where you key in the registration plate for the car into this API and that'll shoot across to one of these data reference companies and they'll send you back like a lookup, which is, you've probably heard of the National Vehicle Identification Code, ENVIC, that's glasses lookup, or you have the vehicle key from Red Book and so on and so forth. And once you've got that, and that is an extremely granular level of detail on the vehicle, down to the difference in the colour of the leather on the seats. It's very, very detailed. Of course, when you look up, you've got the, how much the car was when it was new, how much it's worth now to trade, how much it's worth now on the yard. And, of course, every aspect of the technical specifications of the car, like the engine size, the number of gears, the number of doors, the tyre sizes, you name it, it's there in abundance. So all you need is that API and the registration plate, and you can get all that. That's huge, right? And so getting a lot of detail about the vehicle, that's certainly easy. And then one other key piece of data that's been collected because there have been some simple thresholds over the years, is the odometer reading on the car. So particularly for warranty, the number of kilometres the car's travelled and the age of the vehicle, that's a very good proxy for how worn out it is at the start of the warranty. So there's actually a lot of data there. And as I said before, if you've got the analytical staff on the payroll of the insurer and they've got access to this data and some software to analyse it, getting all that stuff done, that's the easy bit. (laughs) <laughs> the bigger barriers are actually all the other things we've talked about today, like convincing management that there's a there's a good argument for risk rating because you, you're definitely going to upset the dealers. There's no sales manager or chief executive officer that's going to look at a major disruption and see their sales collapsing for a time because they've upset all their distributors. They're not going to take that decision like no two ways, you know. So absolutely the data that's out there, there's such a huge load of it available. And of course, insurers have been great at capturing all the financial data. So you might you'll know the policy number that generated a particular claim and you'll know how much money you paid on particular dates. So that's all well and good. And you need that even for community rating. But it's all that extra granularity that you get back from these automotive data reference firms like Red Book and Glasses. That gives you all the detail on the vehicle that in conjunction with knowing the odometer and other things like that, you can do well out of. And, of course, another good source of information is you get a lot of these annual insurers also do comprehensive motor insurance, right? And 30 to 40% of the claims paid on a comp motor insurer are for total losses. They will have a very deep understanding of what drives the risk of a total loss. And, of course, that can be used to inform risk-rated pricing on your gap policy that we talked about earlier. Because if, if your gap covers the shortfall between the payout, total loss payout from the comp motor insurer and the finance balance, it's outstanding. You know that the driver of that, the trigger event for that claim is a total loss. And so if you know the total loss frequency in your motor portfolio and it varies by the age of the driver and the sum and short of the car and where they live and all these sorts of things, then you've got a ready source of information that can inform the pricing of your gap policy. What you just raised in terms of the model comprehensive data insurance is it also got me thinking that perhaps the point of the sales that happen for the motor vehicle add-on insurance could have actually happened at the 
time when the insurer are selling the model comprehensive insurance instead of the time when someone is purchasing the vehicle. Do you think looking at that from a different perspective could change the result of having more penetration for the model vehicle yeah. insurance? Absolutely. So I think a lot of companies, and inevitably we will too, will look to a, what we might call a B2C offering. That is having a website where you're selling warranties and gaps directly to the consumer. There are some barriers. I and mean, look, you know, some insurers out, of, out there in the market are already doing that. And certainly we've got plans to go down that road as well in the fullness of time, subject to it being viable. But there's a couple of things that can make it tricky. Firstly, with extended warranty, the dealers have to provide a 90-day, 5,000-kilometre statutory warranty. So we are not actually on risk for the first 90 days because the dealer is. And so the dealer has an incentive to make sure that vehicle is in reasonably good mechanical condition because otherwise they're going to have it back to them two or three times in that 90 days to fix it before we start paying for it, right? So it's almost like a time-based excess so it gives the dealer an incentive to do it. Whereas when you're selling direct to a consumer on a website, you can kind of imagine that consumers who know they're buying a car with problems would be attracted to a product that didn't require them to pass any kind of test, for that vehicle to pass any kind of test. So then you're into a whole web of complication in that if you're going to put an extended warranty on a website and sell direct to a consumer, you probably won't make them very happy if you say you've got to wait 90 days before you got some cover. And you're only probably going to attract people who think that their car is going to conk out. They probably forgot as well after 90 days. <laughs> possibly. There's possibly that. So you have to bring in things like a pre-purchase inspection. So it's a complication and it takes time. It could possibly not run well. You probably have some teething problems and that could be quite difficult. Similarly with a GAP product or a CCI type product, the standard offerings that you get through a dealership when those items are being talked about, the, the dealer has to undergo training. They have to have had training in the sale of those products. They have to have a, a reasonable understanding of those products in order to sell them to people. Whereas when you're online, you're relying on the person to be navigating through your website. So you're, it's harder when you can't have a conversation with the person and you've, you've got a limited number of things. Like you can have little video clips and call outs that describe certain features of the product and all that sort of stuff but there's nothing quite like having a conversation with a person so what you end up with is much simpler products i think it's a definitely a viable market but you'd also have to be convinced that people see the value and the need for these markets for these products that's not so assured just yet i think from my perspective we need to improve the products that we distribute through dealers first to rebuild the reputation of these products generally before we just try and go direct to the market with a with a B2C type offering. Now, that's just my view. I certainly think that it's there's a lot of repair work to do. And look, that's one of our sort of strategic goals, right? Partnering with AWM, we, we, we've got a, a sort of a, a goal to become recognised as the good guys who cleaned up add-on insurance in the automotive space. We want to be recognised for giving good, fair products at fair prices and just doing the right thing by people rather than just diffing them with these little mousetrap products. It's got to stop. You know, it's not sustainable. So we want to do the right and be known for that. I'm excited to see that and I look forward to see the changes in this industry of the add-on insurance. So, And I think this pretty much bring us to almost the end of the interview of this podcast episode. Now, these are the two questions that I normally ask every single of my guests. The very first one that I have got for you is, what is your most important first principle? It's hard to say because there are many different things, but like if you think of the, the title of the paper that I published, which was Deep Fried Bananas. <laughs> I love that title. <laughs> and I called it that because... The first page of the paper is a little bit of a joke about where, what is a deep fried banana. And of course, we start with the organic banana, which is the epitome of wholesome goodness. And then, of course, by the time we've peeled it, dunked it in batter and deep fried it and saturated animal fat, and rolled it in sugar, and we're eating it, we've taken that beautiful, wholesome, natural, good thing, a banana, and we've completely ruined it <laughs> and made it about six, eight times the price. <laughs> so, I just think. For me, don't deep fry your banana. I think that's what I'm, I'm getting at. And I think that any insurance company can make a fair and reasonable profit 
competitive market by offering a reasonable product. I don't think there's a need to keep putting out there all these sort of nasty little products with their tricky wording and lack of coverage and all these sorts of things. I mean, and I think it goes deeper than that, right? Because capitalism is a thing. It doesn't have to be bad, right? It does not have to be bad. Now, I'm not saying it isn't sometimes bad, and it most certainly is. Greed is a force of human nature that has to be overcome. But the problem is when capitalism does go bad, it fuels the flames in the for those people who would believe that some kind of extreme socialist communist type of view is a better way. Whereas my personal view is those things, they, they offer no incentive for people to outperform. And that's what's happened with, you know, all the Eastern Bloc countries in Europe and various other jurisdictions around the world. Communism has just collapsed because people became completely disincentivized to make a, a better fist of their life. And even what we've got in China at the moment, the Chinese Communist Party, I mean, it's the biggest misnomer of all time. I mean, look, I don't want to get into politics, but they're not communist, they're not, not in my view. And look, we all, as I sometimes say, we all want a safety net for people, but not a hammock. <laughs> and I suppose I've, I've sort of I've adapted a quote from Winston Churchill here because he's, he's sort of famous for saying, you know, democracy is the worst system of government in the world except for everything else. And I, w- I would say that capitalism is the worst way in the world for economies to run except for everything else. So, you know, I think you've got to do your bit for a sort of reasonable capitalism by just not continuing to to be greedy and try and rip people off. You can still make a reasonable profit just doing right and fair things. I love that one. I think there's a lot of trying to find a word to describe it, but I hear where you're coming from. I think I personally, if I share my own view, is I think it really got to take a balance of the capitalism. I think if we go to the full extreme side of the capitalism is really ruling the world. And you're already a billion dollars rich. I mean, what difference does it make when it adds another hundred million to your to your bank account? <laughs> Just to go in the extreme of the capitalism. But well, that's a topic for another day and uh, <laughs> that we don't necessarily want to upset some of the listeners. <laughs> I might have been challenging sometimes. Now, that brings me to the second question I have got for you, and that's my very last question. What is one book that you have read and thought it would have been better for your younger self to have? Okay. I've read a lot of books in my life. I like to read. We can you can see I've got a bookshelf there. I've got them both sides of me, to be honest. I really don't think I've read any one book that I think would necessarily meet this idea that you're driving at. But I'll tell you what I think. I I think that I don't believe you can pressure cook wisdom. I think that wisdom takes its time with age and experience, and there's not a hell of a lot that you can really do to speed up the acquisition of wisdom. Because you might say, read something that's very insightful and thoughtful when you're 40 or 50. But if you read that same thing when you were 20, it would just be words on a page that would just go in in through your eyes, hit your brain and just be forgotten till you read them 20 years later. I just, I think there's a very, if someone doesn't have the experience, I just don't necessarily think that reading some particularly wise words is going to stick. So I'm not sure that there is a book that meets that breach. But look, you know what? I can remember when I was about eight years old, uh, my mum bought something called the Desiderata. Say that again, please. (laughs) Desiderata. It's so D-E-S-I-D-E-R-A-T-A. I'll send it to you after this so you know exactly what it is. What it basically is, is there's some guy called Max Ehrman, about 100 years ago, wrote this one-page summary of how to live your life. And it's full of all sorts of little nuggets of wisdom. I tell you, there's there's more nuggets of wisdom on one page there than anything else I've ever read, you know. It's a great summary. And look, as I said, my mum stuck that on the wall when I was about eight years of age in the dining area. So every night I'd be eating at dinner and there'd be the desiderata up on the wall and I'd have a read. And it all just went in, in one ear and out the other. So I've been reading that since I was eight or nine, but it probably wasn't until I'd hit 40 and you've made all these different mistakes in your life and you've had all these experiences and you start seeing all those things in the desideration. (laughs) That's actually pretty clever. I didn't realise that when I was 8 or 15 or 20. 
or even 30. You know, it's just one of those things that it just takes time for you to see the relevance of it. So it's one thing to read something. It's another thing for it to make a difference. And I, I'm just not sure that it's possible to um, to speed up wisdom. And it's, I suppose the closest thing I can come to, I don't know if you've ever watched The Simpsons, the five years old love The Simpsons and think it's really funny, you know. And then when they get to about 12, they sort of love it all over again because they start seeing the different layers. And then they sort of love it all over again in their 20s as they start seeing something else they hadn't seen before. And I think it's a bit like that, you know. It just, even though it's the exact same cartoon playing, there's a whole lot of stuff going on and being said that you don't realize how funny it is until you've got that life experience. So, sorry, I've kind of upended your hopes there that there was some magic panacea book that could make us all wise when we're 25. But, you know, so you can probably do a bit about it. But yeah, I think, um, I would probably say the Desiderata is, is the best thing you could read for how to live your life because it's it's only one page long, so you could read it every day and it's not going to take much time. I definitely will put that one on the list or at least in the blog article that we are writing up, if that's okay. Now, thank you so much again, Tim, for this conversation. Uh, if I will have to highlight part of this is really the understanding of the market composition and understanding how the market are structured and how the consumer, the purchasing psychology and the you know the various stages as, as well as the dealership, the challenges that they face, that makes us such a di- difference. And often understanding, having those contexts in the background and understand how it impacts the market is really, really important when it comes to make doing the analogy. Sometimes doing analogy is not just about take the data, build a model, and then say, we have done the <laughs> analogy. It is about understanding and having that full picture. And in, in this episode, I think really the, you have shown us the importance of understanding that bigger picture. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure, Jason. Absolutely. I'll send you an email with the Desiderata on it so you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs>